Move to the to, to the US to Silicon Valley actually work basically in the sort of defense electronics business and designing broadband amplifiers for many years. Uh, <coughs> that included uh, when I was a founder of Solaritech, a company which also um, was doing Gallimard Snide broadband amplifiers. The reason I'm telling you all this is because um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, you know, obviously it's old codger talk, and I you know you 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 hesitate to become one of the old codgers that I used to see 20 years ago, thinking, oh my gosh, hope I'm not ever like that guy. That's not <laughs> naming, mentioning no names. <coughs> but the, 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 the thing about it is, we're talking the subject, all right? Um, this RFPA design, and I think, uh, you know, the great debate sort of thing, which we're obviously seeing some of the later speakers uh, are going to come along and say, you know, that uh, people like me have been doing it all wrong all of these years. And uh, I do object to that. And so I hope you're not going to say that, uh, you know, I've designed a lot of things over the years, and a lot of them did work. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you know, all of them worked, you know, or a few failures here and there. But, uh, you know, uh, design tools are great, and I'm a great believer in using uh, all of them, actually, to the greatest possible extent. Um, but I have always had uh, a bit of a, an issue in the sense that it always seems that what I'm working on today doesn't simulate all that well, you know, and I have to get a little bit more creative, a bit more intuitive, and think a bit more physics. What I was designing, you know, uh, five years ago is, is now not a problem. You know, it sort of <laughs> seems as though the, the simulation tools and the models for devices sort of are always seem to be lagging behind where I happen to be. Now, again, that sounds like I lead a very exciting life and all that's not really the case, you know, I'm, and I'm talking about industry. I am obviously in academia now, so that obviously applies even more uh, we're doing sort of, you know, outrageous things, you know, really, uh, in, in my little group at uh, Cardiff, as far as broadband amplifiers, broadband power amplifiers in particular. But uh, that's a bit different. But I mean, even when I was working in industry all of those years, you know, it always seemed as though the sort of the product development plan that you were supposed to be developing in engineering were all things that hadn't really been done before, you know. And uh, so anyway, that's just a little bit of a personal uh, background. So... Um, this, was, this, this talk is somewhat based, as you can see, on a talk I gave. It's a bit of a dead giveaway, that isn't it, IMS 2015. I have actually made some changes to that particular talk, but I imagine probably most of you didn't uh, were not present anyway. This was actually a session organized by Freescale. And I think, did I see? Uh, <laughs> yes, there's, yes, there's certainly one person here. Uh, so uh, it was a good session, actually. And uh, I think the original idea was that um, they wanted the, the two factions, you know, the... Uh, the physical modeling, the sort of the more traditionalists were going to stand up and sort of really, you know, sort of shoot it out with the uh, the behavioral modelists. Uh, and uh, I sort of said, well, actually, you know, in a sense, I think that's possibly the wrong way around, because as far as I'm concerned, behavioral modeling, if you call low pull behavioral modeling, designing amplifiers using essentially measured a measurement, a, a data measurement basis uh, is extremely old. I mean, that's what I did in 1980 or 81 when I moved over to California and was presented with this product development plan, one of which was a 2 to 8 gigahertz 1 watt amplifier. Uh, very easy these days with, uh, with, with uh, you know, gallium nitride and so on. But um, back in that time, that was sort of, you know, very much a, a product that, uh, that nobody had. And uh, so, uh, you know, the first thing I started to do was find out, going through a few cupboards and Find a, found some tuners, found some Maori tuners, and started doing some low-pole measurement. There, there was simply no other way of doing it, you know. I mean, I think we were aware of it. We had a, a linear simulator. This was an in-house. This was before the days of, you know, of, of ESOF and uh, Compact and all of that. Well, P Compact was around, but in fact, WJ, the company, they had their own, um, they had their own uh, in-house program. Um, and... Um, so, you know, uh, load pull what was simply the only way of doing things. And uh, so, so in that sense, I, I tend to think we're sort of almost uh, coming full circle a, a little bit here because, you know, I mean, I have sort of, in a sense, I suppose, based my career and whatever reputation I may have uh, behind me, uh, largely on, 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 on um, measurement-based uh, design uh, uh, techniques. So... Um, that, that, those are the sort of the, the, the factions, if you like. The, the, the physical modeling, to my way of thinking, came in quite a bit later. 
I think I think back when I first got involved, um, a actually with, with, with Triquint, but that's only harm in mentioning names, um, sort of in the mid-1990s, uh, doing uh, really the first generation of handset PA designs. Um, I worked quite a bit with that company, and uh, they had quite interesting, quite a lot of, of, a few of their designers came from the analog world. It was very interesting. I was feeling there's quite a bit of a culture sort of difference when you're working with somebody who sort of designs op amps and, you know, sort of things like that. Um, they did use um, simulation quite a lot. They used spice. You know, spice was their, their big thing. You know, spice was, their whole life was spice, you know. It was like, you know, it was to say, what does spice say? <laughs> you know, I sort of, uh, everything was done on spice. And they had, they had models, you know. Um, uh, they had device models, which they used on spice, and I started doing it. So that was really my first introduction to using um, a nonlinear simulator uh, in the form of SPICE. Harmonic balance was around in those days, but it, in, in its earlier form, but I used to have trouble getting simply converging. You know, as soon as my amplifier went into any amount of compression, uh, some of those early harmonic balance programs um, sort of failed to converge. Um, something which has somewhat improved, I might say. <laughs> Sorry, choose my words carefully. Um, so anyway, uh, th that, that, that's that. So I say, in, in a way, really, I view uh, using nonlinear CAD um, programs and uh, gradually improving physical models for transistors as being a relatively recent uh, development in actual fact. And of course, um, you know, behavioral modeling has always been with us uh, in, in the sense of, of load pull. I think the only difference now, I notice my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Tasker, has just walked in. So I'm probably not going to have to modify a little bit now what I was going to say. Um, <coughs> the, um, what we're really saying here is, I think, I is that, you know, technology, measurement technology has improved. You know, rather than taking, you know, 10 minutes to measure one frequency point, which I used to do uh, in my, you know, when I found my Maori tuner at Watkins Johnson, uh, you know, we can now make measurements very fast. I'm not going to come out with any numbers because I think it's a little bit of a contentious area in actual fact between what we would like and what we have said we can do versus what we can actually do. But we obviously can make a very, very fast um, load pull measurement. So it, it comes to a point where you sort of say, well, do we actually need uh, the physical models, you know, at all. Mine says you need both. I think that there is a place for both, and that's really um, my sort of conclusion. Uh, and maybe I better move on a little bit to here. Um, so uh, probably I, uh, what I sometimes uh, tend to do, which is to sort of say what's on the next three slides, and then you kind of get to the next three slides. What do I actually mean by physical mod? Talking here, the physics-based device models. Uh, uh, ironically, you know, of course, these models are not themselves physics-based. You know, in the case of FET transistors, you know, FETs, often, you know, the DC characteristics are actually themselves behavioral. You know, <laughs> you actually measure them and you fit some abstract mathematical function. So, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's all a little bit uh, fuzzy, really, in terms of what really is the difference between these two, uh, two main headings. I, however, for one, and uh, I'm glad that my Cardiff colleagues, you know, picked it up 20 years later, uh, have always been a firm believer in working at the device plane, uh, device plane waveforms. And it certainly, uh, as I'll show you in a second, it took me um, many, many years to convince people about that. Um, and uh, in fact, it seems as though there is still uh, work to be done uh, in convincing the, the design community to work and to at least look at your waveforms at the device plane, because with a, with a modern simulator, of course, you can do that. Although, as Malcolm was saying, you do need a package model. Uh, that there's been slow progress on that, you know. I mean, you go to even today's suppliers, you know, say, hey, look, have you got a package model? You know, it's sort of like, well, maybe, you know, but we're not quite sure whether we'll let you have it and all this kind of thing. Um, and of course, the other thing is bandwidth, you see. I think that the other thing is that straight away, you know, I, I landed sort of um, in, into broadband designs, octave and multi-octave band designs, where you really do, you know, you are simply not able to hit the, the exact points. Now, of course, Peter, Peter Abbey may have something to say about that uh, later <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, designing a circuit that actually sort of comes as close as you can to hitting the optimum points over a, over a wide frequency band. But the... Uh, the load pull based uh, certainly uh, is, is, is a somewhat different, considerably different philosophy. We are usually working at the package plane. You know, if you're doing load pull measurements, I mean, I've had these discussions with designers like, well, wh wh why bother going to the device plane? I mean, my matching is done at the package. That's the point at which I say hello to my transistor. You know, it's, it's the package tab. 
So therefore, the, the, the sort of the, the, the culture there has always been simply to uh, do local measurements referred to the package plane. And uh, I mean, a vastly proven success record. I mean, you know, there are many, many, many designs uh, have been done that actually worked and many of them actually probably work pretty well um, first time as well. I, I do, and I know Paul's heard me say it, so I don't mind saying it with Paul here. You know, I do get, I get pissed off, you know, when, when, when I'm told, you know, that it's sort of like what I do can't, po you know, this, 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 this sort of first-pass design success business. You know, I'm not saying we had first-pass de design success all of the time, but we certainly had it some of the time. You know, it wasn't sort of something that has only come along since we started doing, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, the sort of the more X-parameter, you know, type behavioral models. So anyway, right, so... Um, the um, working at the device plane is uh, essentially uh, very straightforward uh, if we uh, model our device at that point as a voltage-controlled current source. I always think we're very lucky, really, in a sense, that um, certainly FETs or, you know, HEMTs or whatever, you know, the, the, the field effect transistors you make, you know, the gallium arsenide, the gallium nitride, um, they do actually really behave quite well in that sense. I mean, that is a fairly good approximation as to what the device does in a physical sense. It's quite a good physical model for uh, f the, the kind of microwave devices we use, uh, that it is essentially a voltage cro control current source. And the output voltage, therefore, we can compute using Ohm's law, essentially. And uh, we can then engineer that voltage by, uh, desi by designing our, our, our matching networks. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to have to watch my time a little bit too. Uh, th this, this was the um, paper which I presented back in 1983 uh, at the then Microwave MTT Symposium, I think it was called in those days. But um <coughs> I always think it is quite fun just to read what I said in the first line. The use of load pull contours in the design of solid state power amplifiers is well established. Right, this is uh, 1983. Yeah. Um, the information contained in a load pull plot is of particular importance for broader band designs, which is what I was doing then, where exact synthesis of the optimum output load at all frequencies is not possible and a compromise must be made. Unfortunately, the generation of a set of load pull contours is a laborious procedure if performed manually using mechanical tuners. As a result, several workers it's 1983, by right? As a result, several workers have built computer control systems which undoubtedly speed up the me measurement procedure but involve a large capital expenditure in dedicated equipment and setting up time which cannot always be justified. So that hasn't changed all that much, really, has it? Um, the, this was the paper I presented. It was a poster session. These are kind of, you know, hand-drawn things and you know, all that, so it didn't have, uh, you know, t PowerPoint was, what, still, you know, 20 years ago. Well, not 20 years ago. Um, but so th this is where I actually sort of did this sort of simple-minded thing and showed that these local contours uh, were not circles. That was really the, that was the, that was the big achievement of this, that you actually look at the clipping levels and so on and you say, well, yeah. Uh, basically, we match the output such that we engineer the voltage swing, and if you do that, you get a significantly different answer from ma matching S22. And indeed, if you follow the logic, including reactive uh, components of the load as well, you end up with these. Basically, the, the contours are basically intersecting circles of, of constant resistance and constant admittance. Always have a little bit more fancy footwork describing what goes on on the right-hand side of those contours. In all honesty, I know, um, uh, I know. Uh, Rowan's not here, is he? Rowan Gilmore, a fellow lecturer of mine at CEI. Keeps every time I see him, he tells me that's wrong. But, um, but you know, he's, he's from Australia, so... Yeah. Um, they kind of walk upside down and all this stuff, don't they? Um, they don't play cricket all that well either, really. But yeah. um, I gotta, yeah, I, I'm going to have to move on a little bit here, uh, if I can. Um, as, as I say, um, for some reason, I, I, I remember having um, a lot of trouble uh, in convincing people to work at the device plane. You know, for example, I think that this, this, this is a slide I've used for sort of many, many years. Right? It's really just a, a sort of reflecting some of what Malcolm was saying earlier. You know, that the, this is showing how the, the, the sort of, you know, the, if you work at the device plane, it's basically frequency independent, you know, I mean, it's just voltage and current. If you start putting picofarads and, and nanohenries in there, then of course it becomes frequency dependent. And so this is a frequency sweep where, you know, in, in a sense at, at zero frequency, if you like, 
you're at the device plane, and so you get this. This is the sort of the Crips contour um, sitting upright on the real axis. But then, of course, as you move to the um, package plane, uh, at as the frequency increases, obviously this thing does a sort of a bit of a bit of a, a tumble, tumble, tumble backwards. If I was in America, I'd say it's a bit like you know the American cheerleaders, but we don't have them over here. It's, it's very unfortunate that. Anyway, um, so so that's that. And uh, it can make a lot of difference. You know, this is a bit of an extreme example, but I always just like to show it. Um, you know, you do your load line calculation, and uh, this is a uh, this is an LDMOS device. It's a bit of an old one actually, but you know, 25 watt device. So you know, 28 volts. Subtract three for the knee, optimistically, uh, and uh, divide by two amps. Yeah, 12 and a half ohms. And I remember actually this. This was somebody actually once phoned me, but it didn't have email in those days, you know. Somebody phoned me and says, oh, you know, it's wrong. You know, I, I've done my load pull measurement. I'm down at about one ohm. But you, s according to your theory, it's 12 and a half ohms. I said, yes, <laughs> of course it is, because you haven't taken, you, you, you have not moved back to the, to, the, to the device plane. And it can, you can see, you know, the, 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 this, the, the, the CDS, uh, in some cases, can make that much difference. You know, it's, it's, it's 12 ohms here, but it's, I'm afraid it's one ohm out, out, out there. So anyway, this is just a little bit of uh, detail stuff. You, you know, it, it enables you to, s to use synthesis techniques to uh, find these. When you're going to octave band, I, I do tend to sort of start off using a fairly simple synthesis procedure. Uh, Chebyshev, I just have a spreadsheet on Excel these days that sort of works out the values, does the transformation. Um, it is just interesting to note that, uh, in fact, the, the Chebyshev filter gives you this green response, which is fitting inside the contour quite nicely, it turns out that in actual fact, because of the fact it's not a circle, you can actually change the, um, the sort of, the, the, the you know, you can actually move the, the values away. Chebyshev is not the ID, is not, is, the, is not the optimum solution for a power match. You can sort of stretch things out a bit and get significantly more transformation from the network by sort of utilizing this extra space. But, you know, some people think that's getting a bit academic, which maybe it is, but now I am an academic one. Um, what follows next is really just showing the evolution of work that we have been doing, particularly Paul has been um, much involved in, in this, uh, certainly earlier on, um, uh, with, with this whole class J. We seem to be hearing an awful lot about class J stuff yesterday, so I think maybe I'll cut this on. Not maybe not all of you were, were, were seeing. We seem to have sort of several papers yesterday addressing this whole thing about um, how you don't necessarily have to short circuit the second harmonic. I'm, I'm sort of jumping subjects a little bit here. The purpose of this sort of section that I'm going to go through fairly quickly is really just to show how device plane waveform engineering is still evolving, and we still are very strong believers of it uh, at Cardiff in the work we're doing. Um, this was um, I always call this my cathartic moment when I actually looked at this expression here, which is the sort of second harmonic, this is the class J waveform. So you've got equal uh, real and imaginary components at the fundamental. That enables you to sort of fit in some second harmonic. So in other words, you don't really have to short the second harmonic. And it's a sign, so it's a reactive. I remember staring at this uh, and actually realizing that it factorizes. Um, there was then, I think, a session, and I always try to give credit here, but I think it was actually Paul, myself, and Bassi. Bassi Nuri, not here. He's moved, on, he's moved on to other things. We spent the whole afternoon in a, um, a sort of a somewhat dubious establishment. Do you, I don't know whether you've known, have you ever been to the, the Tilted Kilt? Have you been to sort of those places in the US? Anyway, we were there all afternoon, and I, we were kicking this around, and I think this was how we ended up formulating it, basically putting the, um, this beta factor here uh, which generates a family waveform. The whole idea is that this is what we call a positive definite function. The whole point about messing around with harmonics is you do not want the harmonics to push the voltage below zero because that's sort of fairly disastrous. It clips the waveform and power goes down. Your efficiency does not necessarily go down when you start clipping, and that's an interesting little twist that I'm working with at the moment, but now that I've moved more into military radar, pulse radar, it's sort of like they don't actually mind their amplifiers clipping. In fact, they even use that to control the power. So it's a, sort of a little bit, I'm just sort of a little bit more careful now about how disastrous clipping may be, but it certainly does reduce the power, and of course it creates havoc as far as any linearization is concerned. So you get this family of, of, of waveforms, and I say I want to move on reasoning that this is the design space as we call it. I think this is all fairly well uh, published and now being sort of quite widely used. Networks sort of start to behave roughly the way you want, so you can get a bit more 
uh, you know, help you, you ba basically more substantial bandwidth design, although people have argued. I just wanted to say a few things about this. This is really the next stage of the evolution of the this theory um, that we're doing. It's all very much waveform engineering still. This is where we're actually saying, well, um, class 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 J or class BJ, whatever you call it, we are uh, constraining the um, we're constraining the impedance, uh, of course, to be uh, sorry. I'll my but my up and down button seems to be failing at the moment. Um, okay, just t takes a little bit of time. Sorry about that. The um, we are assuming that we can design a network where which constrains the second harmonic always to be completely reactive. This is actually one reason we uh, f we spent a, a, a certain amount of time we, we 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 sort of went on a bit of an offshoot doing push pull circuits because of course with a push pull circuit you can do that um, if you can figure out how to design broadband balance that expand uh, which we spent a lot of time doing as well. Uh, the push pull is actually fits very nicely with this concept because the 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 uh, the balance impedances are entirely reactive. And uh, however, uh, that's not always what you want to do for various reasons. And uh, so we were really asking the, sort of the question here, well, OK, can we extend this theory? Can we extend this sort of zero grazing waveform concept to include second harmonic impedances that are sort of in no man's land here, which, which is what you w normally will have when you actually design a network? You know, you can maybe make the fundamentals sit in the right area here, but then there'll be a sort of a, it'll dive towards a reactive termination, but somewhere in the middle here, you're going to be sort of somewhat in conflict. So we wanted to really extend our theory a bit, and that's what we did with these, what we call the clipping contours. Uh, there's a bit of maths, which I don't think I even have here, which is probably just as well, because I wanted to move on. Um, these are essentially what the green regions represent, is if you choose your fundamental, impedance. Uh, you can actually construct these regions where anywhere inside that region you can put your second harmonic. It, it simply doesn't matter. Anywhere in this sort of green region here that is defined by some equations. There is a transactions paper on this. Tim Canning, my former PhD student, I don't, don't think he's here, I think he works at Infineon now, uh, did sort of uh, work this whole thing out mathematically. So this is sort of based on equations, is equation based. And uh, this is a, a useful design tool which we're just sort of really starting to um, pursue. In fact, I have a, a postdoc now who is going to, I hope, uh, really uh, sort of really um, sort of incorporate this into into sort of uh, you know equations into uh, maybe AWR uh, so that we can actually draw these lines. Just five minutes left. Okay, so you can get some jolly nice interesting shapes as you kind of do this. Okay, so. Um, I've got to move on a bit here, talking about load pull. Well, I've said quite a lot about load pull, really, already. Uh, so um, I don't necessarily want to sort of start talking about the ins and outs of active load pull versus passive load pull, uh, because if I say what I think, I probably really will upset my <laughs> colleagues sitting on my right-hand side here. Um, Never-ending debate, okay, between active and passive load pull systems discussed. We haven't got time to discuss it. Um, there's a problem with higher power devices with active load pull. You need to pre-match them, which means you're sort of taking one step away from the from the from the device plane. Um, and uh, so, anyway, okay, moving on. Uh, behavioral models. Obviously, um, I, I don't think I've I don't think I've seen any one mention X parameters in any papers so far this week. Uh, it, there is a slow take up by the design community. Um, and I think that the, 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 the sort of the, the behavioral modelists, uh, X parameters and, and other variations are telling us, the designers, look, you know, uh, this, is, this is the way you can get better simulations because we actually measure the, uh, the conditions that your circuit presents. And uh, I, can, I, can, I can believe that. I mean, I, I, I am prepared to go along with that. Where I think I see this fitting into the design flow is really when you're about to go to fab. You know, as far as I'm concerned, when I'm designing networks, I need the physical model because I need to think about the capacitances and resonating and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I want to work at the device plane. I still want to do that. But once you've actually got a final design and you're ready to go to fab with it, whether it's a board or whether it's a, uh, a mimic, I do think that's where this could come into play. You know, if we can actually sort of say, well, okay, we've got the passive network and we can predict 
more accurately, uh, maybe, what, 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 what the final thing is going to do. And I have thrown this challenge out, have I not? <laughs> We've got some people from Mazuro and, you know, anyone. Uh, I, I'm willing, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's like, here's the transistors I'm using, take them, <laughs> develop, do, do your 10 million measurements or whatever it is in 10 seconds or whatever it is, extract your model, fine, but give it to me so I can use it. <laughs> instead of, I want, when I do my simulation, instead of picking up that little icon that is the physical model for the device I'm using, I pick up this other icon that is your, that contains your vast gigabytes of data. If I can put that into my simulation, my circuit simulation, and get a better some results. I, I'm very happy. I mean, I you know that that's absolutely fine. In fact, I will come along the next session here. I will I will I will tell you. So um, I was going to talk about tuning, but I haven't got time to do that. I don't really understand why it is that um, filter people are allowed to make products that have got a, a million tuning screws and have people sitting tuning them up all day. And yet this is a complete no-no in the amplifier world. First pass design. No production tuning. That's what we. That's all we ever hear, and I don't really understand it. But anyway, there we go. Um, uh, just a couple of li little quick comments. Some of you may have seen this work we've been doing at Cardiff, um, and uh, this is probing actual voltages at the device plane. I'm still a little bit worried, to be honest. I'm still not, and never have been, completely convinced that with all our models and all our simulations, in a real actual amplifier, what really is the waveform? You know, we never know that, do we? We, we? we never really actually know that. We think we know it, you know, but there's a certain amount of blind faith involved, you know, and so that was really the whole idea. Well, I've been messing around with this sort of probably for the best part of 10 years, and, uh, you know, we, we, we are getting somewhere with it. This is a Doherty PA, and you can see how the different, this is another interesting point, how different places on the chip, they actually have different voltages, you know, for example. So that was interesting. But that is something we are pursuing. Um, this is just my explanation as to why, uh, very hand-waving, and I'm going to go a minute over because I have to make this sort of, this is my little joke, really. Um, remember the, um, the restaurant at the end of the universe, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I, I think that one of the problems that happens in real circuits is that you sort of drift very easily into this, what I call this, this, this sort of uh, restaurant at the end of the universe. This is a very dangerous place to be, and microwave circuits can take you there very easily. You know, you just think about the impedance of an open circuit stub. You know, you're, you can get very, very high impedances, and unfortunately you find that very, very small harmonic content, for example, can generate all manner of strange voltages, and I think even on simulations, you know, you see this. You know, you don't, you do sometimes see nice clean waveforms, but other times they're kind of all messed up and have funny little spikes on them. And I think this is sort of what's happening. You know, you, you, you're, you're cir a real circuit is going to spend, is, is going to whisk you over to this restaurant at the end of the universe, and you know, all, all, you know, it, 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 it's a dodgy place to be. Conclusions, conclusions. Um, PA design based on output load pull has been an industry standard for a long time and has paid a lot of bills. Okay. <coughs> uh, CAD nonlinear simulation tools coupled with physically based models have developed slowly. Uh, I was going to have a bit of a rant about that. I still have trouble with models, as Malcolm knows. You know, it takes me about takes me several days to get it along. They, they send these instructions when, when you've actually got them to release the model, which is hard going in itself. You know, I actually pay money for these transistors. You know, I'm at a university. They seem to think that we're asking for free freebies. I'm saying, no, I've, I've got money. I've actually paid money for these transistors. I'm a paying customer. And they still want you to sign all these stupid things. And, and then and finally, they send you this model file with the instructions. And you follow the instructions, and it don't work. That's, but I must say, Malcolm has been very helpful about that. Um, phone Malcolm if you have a problem, but maybe, I, maybe, maybe I'm the only person who has such problems. Uh, I know we've observed. Behavioral modeling is new. I think it may have a role to play, but I'm afraid yet it is unproven. Now, I'm sure we're going to hear otherwise later on, but sorry, guys. You know, uh, I, want, I want you to give me a model for my transistors that I can see for myself how my designs that I'm working on pan out uh, versus, the, versus the more traditional approach and versus the final measurement. Very happy to do that. Absolutely, really, really happy to cooperate with anybody who is willing to do that. But I don't want to do it with your device and your narrow band spot frequency amplifier. I want to do it on my four to one band <laughs> bandwidth push pull amplifier that is, you know, a lot more complicated. Uh, right, that's it.